You're listening to Big World Network. Amazing Grace, Episode 11. Written by James Helvig, read by Megan Hedin. And in local news, police are still investigating the tragic deaths of a hometown hero and popular pastor, along with one of her star instructors, apparently victims of gang-related retribution. Several arrests have been made, and we again ask for your assistance in locating this young woman. A photo of Regis fills the broadcast screen, along with her name and address. Please contact the authorities with any information at the number on your screen. She was last seen with the victims and is currently missing. A memorial service for the pair will be held this Saturday. Mother Steele hears the broadcast without truly registering its content. Her red-rimmed eyes reflect the flickering light of the early morning newscast without seeing it. She's been living it since Tuesday, three days now. I've made all the arrangements. Why is it so hard to believe? Blinking furiously to stave off more tears, Mother Steele grumbles aloud. Come on, old woman. Tammy would have a fit if she caught you moping. Dale watches grimly as his former commander is loaded into an ambulance. Both the attending physicians and the receiving medical staff had vehemently protested his insistence on the transfer. Dale didn't give a damn. If he couldn't keep her secure, she wouldn't stay breathing long anyway. He'd given them 48 hours to stabilize her and then carried out the arrangements. Two full platoons of Delta operators, along with a SEAL team detachment, had volunteered for this assignment a fully staffed safe house and rehab facility, known only to a handful of the nation's top spooks, awaited them. The entire security detachment would be made up of hardened professionals. Demona's alumno might be connected, but even if that hateful bitch could find them, assaulting this target wouldn't be possible. Finally found a way to keep you still. Induced coma. Who'd have thought anything could crack that thick skull? Meeting Father Bernard's tired gaze, Dale extends a hand. He shakes first the priest's hand and then the police commander's, saying, Gentlemen, thank you. I appreciate both your efforts and I understand the strain it's been. I'll contact you when we arrive and get settled. Father Bernard clears his throat noisily, asking, When can we share the truth about Tammy's condition? Focusing on the tiny voice speaking in his earpiece, Dale holds up a finger and presses his throat mic, saying softly, Copy, before speaking to the waiting duo. Father, I'll let you know as soon as I can accurately assess the threat level. Or whenever she wakes up. If she wakes up. Nodding at the two tired men, Dale closes the ambulance door and steps quickly to the passenger side. In moments, the motorcade is gone, leaving Max smoking beside Father Bernard and staring up into the dark sky. Brenda and Kat flank Anna as she walks slowly down the lightly lit hall. They have been brought here in blindfolds, wearing earmuffs and having only been told that Tammy is badly injured. Not how or where or any other detail they have tried to ask. Anna is scared. She cried herself to sleep on the harried flight that Kat arranged with the military aircraft. Kat is unusually quiet, and that frightens her even more. Squeezing Kat's hand, Anna asks quietly, Are you going to tell me what happened now that we're here? Stopping at the entrance of the dimly lit room, Kat swallows hard, looking Anna in the eye and saying, Yes, sweetie, I'm sorry about the secrecy, but the people that did this are powerful. We don't know the extent of their reach, yet. Face growing grim, Kat continues, There's more, but let's see MT first, okay? Stepping into the room, Anna notices the monitors and medical equipment, which she expected. The heavily armed guard in the corner surprises her. Crossing the small space quickly, Anna stands beside the bed, looking down at the swollen and bandaged head before her as her eyes travel to each tube and wire. A tear slides down her face and she reaches out, placing a hand lightly on Tammy's hand. Voice quivering, Anna whispers softly, Mom, it's okay. I'm here now. Kat stands behind her, hands gently holding her shoulders. Anna's grandmother stands teary-eyed on the opposite side of the bed. Leaning back into her aunt, Anna sobs, asking, How bad? Sighing loudly, Kat hugs her, answering quietly. Bad enough. The doctors have induced a coma. She has a skull fracture and a concussion. She was stabbed through the left breast and has a punctured lung. Luckily, the knife missed her heart. Come on. Kat gently turns Anna back towards the door, adding, We'll come back later. Nodding at the guard, Kat leads them down the hall a short distance to a small bedroom. 
Motioning to the bed, she says, Have a seat. This is where you'll be staying. I'll show you around in a bit, but I've got to explain a few things first. Tammy wasn't alone when she was ambushed. Alberto was killed. Before the shock of that news fully settles, Cat continues. We think by the weapons dealer Demonis Alumno posing as his girlfriend. Holding each other, Anna and Brenda reel from the shocking revelation. Cat gives them a moment to recover and then tells them, The rest of the world, outside of this facility, thinks MT is dead, and we have to keep it that way for as long as we can. Moving to sit beside them, Cat embraces her niece, struggling to maintain her composure. Anna sniffles, asking, Just until Mom wakes up, right? Closing her eyes, Cat mumbles softly, Right, baby. If she wakes up. Please wake up, Tammy. Jorge watches nervously as Demonis Alumno rages at the man fidgeting on the large flat screen. You find that bitch, the arms merchant screams. The ashes in that urn didn't belong to her. I don't care what it costs. Fail me and your life is forfeit. Jabbing the computer key to end the transmission, Demonis Alumno slams the laptop shut before picking it up and throwing it across the room. Snarling, she turns to Jorge, face contorted into an ugly mask, black eye patch a stark reminder of the recent battle. Report, she snaps. Swallowing bile, Jorge responds. I had the flowers delivered as you ordered. None of my people have any idea of where the pastora has been taken. Apparently, no one in the church or the police department does either. Slamming her hands down on the table, Demonos Alumno stands, growling. Shit! Hands balling into fists, voice lowering coldly, she continues. Your usefulness is already limited. Look harder, or I'll take away the ability to look at all. Nodding, Jorge turns to leave when his name is called softly behind him. Chills running down his spine, he stops, turning to look over his shoulder. Demona Salumno is seated now, her eye patch on the desk. With her empty eye socket and eerie violet eye seemingly staring into his soul, she whispers, Every day, Jorge, until you breathe no more. Remember? Blinking cold sweat from his eyes, Jorge answers hoarsely, Yes, ma'am. Mother Steele walks in silence beside Father Bernard as they stroll slowly towards the setting sun. He's been trying for weeks to get her to come to the park with him. In truth, she has only given in to stop his nagging. Taking her hand, he says lightly, The classes are going better than you'd hoped. Susan and the junior instructors are really working hard to keep the students motivated. Grunting in response, the weary nun continues down the pathway. In a moment, she notices George is no longer beside her. Looking back, she sees him seated at a bench, a melancholy look etched on his normally jovial features. I know the feeling, George. I miss her, too. Patting the bench, Father Bernard motions Mother Steele to him. Suppressing a sigh, she retraces her steps, joining the seated man. Father Bernard says mildly, I have some news. I wanted to tell you sooner, but... Scowling at her friend, Mother Steele snaps. To spit it out, George! Nodding and sitting up a bit straighter, he replies, Tammy is alive, Nancy. The wide-eyed, shocked look Mother Steele replies with has him hurriedly adding, I was sworn to silence. I've been trying to... A hard, open-handed slap to the side of his face stuns him into silence. Mother Steele has swiveled in her seat to face him, and her face is flushed with anger. Gritting her teeth, tears streaming down her face, she says incredulously, How dare you! You lied to me! You let me believe... Damn! Rubbing his jaw, Father Bernard replies, I know, Nancy, but it was the only way. I wouldn't have been told if I hadn't been there when Dale arrived. He's trying to protect us, and no, I have no idea where she is now. I only know that she's alive. I'm sorry. Looking at the bright red print of her hand on her friend's face, Mother Steele places a hand on his chest, sobbing. I'm sorry, George. Leaning forward, they embrace each other, holding tight. Nancy whispers, Alive? Really and truly, George? Nodding, the gruff priest answers softly, Yes, and now you share my burden. No one else can know. Anna slumps in the chair close to Tammy's bed. Her grandmother went back to their room hours ago. Not being able to talk to her friends or leave the safe house is difficult, but the people here are trying so hard to make her comfortable. Kat spends time training with her and showing her the various features of the house and the grounds. It is impressive. 
sensor grids, video and sound surveillance, patrols, and areas devoted to all manner of duties, from a full-size pool to weight rooms and spas. There are a lot of areas that are classified and she isn't allowed near those, which she finds annoying. So this is the kind of stuff Mom did before we met. Wow! Way cooler than I imagined. And more dangerous. The doctor stopped giving Tammy the drugs that were keeping her asleep over a week ago, and scans show that the cranial swelling is reducing. She still hasn't opened her eyes, and Anna can tell that Dale and Kat are more than a little concerned. They explained that until Tammy actually wakes up, the severity of the damage done is largely guesswork. You'll wake up when you're ready, Mom, and I'll be here when you do. A sharp beeping on the monitors announces a change in Tammy's condition. Anna springs out of her chair as Tammy lurches straight up with a strangled gasp, looking wildly left and right. Reaching her side and punching the intercom button, Anna yells at the intercom and the guard who is now moving in her direction. Mom's awake! We need a doctor! This has been a presentation of Big World Network. Visit us on BigWorldNetwork.com for more free weekly series, or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Big World Network.